Hello, everyone. Welcome to using the ACS for model based estimates. I'm going to give just a couple more seconds to make sure that everyone's got their audio all set up and we're, we'll be ready to go. Okay, I want to welcome everyone to using the ACS for model based estimates. We have four really great presentations today, and I want to give plenty of time for each of the speakers. So I'm going to keep my re opening remarks really brief. Uh, I want to ask that you please use the Q&A tool that you see on the right hand side of your screen to ask questions. I will, once all four of the presenters are done, I will read through those questions and direct those to the speakers during the Q&A portion at the end of our presentations today. And rather than use up our precious time with long introductions, I'm going to encourage you to review the speaker bios on the conference website. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chris Clifton. Eric Hansen and Keith Merrill to talk about issues and solutions to providing formal privacy for the ACS. Uh, welcome. So we're I'm Chris Clifton from Purdue University. Uh, Sean is unable to join us today, but we have Keith Merrill and Eric Hansen with us as well, uh, who will be taking on part of the talk and helping out in the Q and A. So what we're going to be talking about uh, is some issues with providing formal privacy and some of the things we've been able to accomplish in a research project. And I should probably mention, while this work was supported by the US Census Bureau under a cooperative research development agreement, the views and opinions expressed are those of the authors and not the US Census Bureau. This is very much a research project. Uh, turns out differential privacy for the American Community Survey is harder than dissent. And when we started on this, uh, everybody was, well, it's harder because it's higher dimensionality. But other than that, it's a smaller data set. There's not so many people. It should be easier, right? Turns out it's a lot harder. The higher dimensionality, uh, that's a well understood problem in the differential privacy community. We have solutions for that. But the fact that ACS is a survey rather than enumeration, an enumeration turns out to make things a lot harder. And we'll present uh, why that's harder, and but some solutions that we've been able to develop for missing data imputation and uh, post-stratification for those who saw the, the talk on ACS weighting that was just held. Uh, so you know, why are there challenges? Well, there's considerable variance in response quality and response rates across different groups geographic differences, demographic differences. And there are a number of statistical methods used to reduce the bias and variance. These stratified sampling uh, approaches that were just discussed, uh, missing data imputation, uh, weight, various weighting, uh, weighting approaches. But these make differential privacy more challenging. Uh, why is this? Well, differential privacy is based on hiding the impact of a, a single individual, any single individual, on any value that is published. And there are a number of statistical methods used to reduce bias and variance in ACS, but these can impact how much one response influences an individual outcome. Uh, you know, a very simple example is weighting. When we think of the decennial, which is an enumeration, one person could change the impact on a count by a value of one. Uh, you know, you have uh, left-handed professors in West Lafayette. Well, if I am there or not, that's going to change that number by at most one. But when we deal with weighted samples, the impact could be, you know, my being in sample or not could be as much as my weight, or actually, as it will see, it could be even greater than that. And since differential privacy is based on hiding the impact of an individual on the published value, if we have a high weighted individual who's it, it was counted in whatever uh, statistic we're publishing, you know, left-handed professors in West Lafayette, we have to add enough noise to cover their highest possible weight, or as we'll see, it could be even worse than that. 
Uh, that said, these problems are solvable. And we will, we have developed formal privacy techniques that accomplish this bias reduction through things like missing data imputation or post stratification uh, that can address those. Uh, now, this isn't to say we've solved the full pro problem of producing a formally private ACS yet. These are things that work in isolation. Uh, putting it all together is still an ongoing challenge. But you'll, as you'll see, uh, things can be a lot better than you might expect. So, you know, the, the first issue here is what is the sensitivity? Uh, you know, sensitivity is the maximum change in a given result. And we're talking things like tabular results uh, from adding or deleting a sin single individual. And so I'm going to turn it over to Keith and let him explain a little more on this. Hi, all right. So I'm Keith Merrill. I'm at Brandeis University. Um, yeah, so the, the phrase differential privacy has been thrown around a lot, and I haven't seen any technical definitions, and don't sweat, we're not going to spare you from it still, but the idea is that the noise infusion for differential privacy is based on, as Chris alluded to a couple slides ago, this idea of sensitivity. How sensitive is the query that you're asking or the table that you're publishing to a change in an individual? So some queries have very low sensitivity, and Chris gave the example of counts on the previous slide. Again, either you're counted or you're not, at least in a simple enumeration like the decennial, so that sensitivity is one. But we could move to something more sophisticated, like, for instance, even an average, and average isn't terribly sophisticated, but an average of income, for example. And you think about, suppose we were in this room, this was clearly written in a better time when we were all together, but uh, we could say on this presentation, if you think about how someone could change the average, well, think about all of a sudden if Warren Buffett comes walking in that's gonna change the average by quite a lot. And in fact, the maximum change that we could encounter with an average of income in the room essentially works out to be no better than the maximal possible income, whatever that top coded value, if it's even top coded at all may be, divided by the number of individuals on the call. And so you can see that for, you know, again, differential privacy has to cover the putative change of any possible individual. And so you can see that that amount of noise in a real world sense where you know, we were talking about individuals with relatively low incomes, this has the possibility of washing out the answer altogether. So <clears throat> this is, so the, the idea here is that we're gonna look for, basically at the heart of it, all differential privacy mechanisms are based on this sensitivity, but we're gonna look for mechanisms that don't make use of global sensitivity, which is the sort of worst case scenario. So let's talk for a moment about missing data imputation. So there's a two-step process uh, generally. Allocate, or sorry, excuse me, assignment is where you just fill in values that are internal to the record. Uh, for instance, if I don't report that I currently have a job, I don't probably need to report wage income for the moment. Those are just consistency checks. No issue on sensitivity there. Um, no issue on privacy either, because again, these are just internal records. These are, sorry, internal attributes that can be inferred from my own record. Uh, if you want to advance, Chris, too. Am I frozen? Okay, hey, all right, there we go. Uh, the, the trickier one is allocation, and this is where you have to infer, you have to make guesses about individuals, usually based on copying those individuals. Again, this is one of many ways to do it, but it essentially comes down to this idea, copying those values from similar looking individuals. But as you can see, this increases sensitivity because now all of a sudden, let's suppose that my income gets imputed on you know, 100 people. Well, then changing me has the potential to not only change my record, but also the income values of those 100 people to whom I donated. Uh, this becomes a problem. So this can dramatically increase the, uh, the uh, sensitivity. So if you want to advance. And in particular, again, in some sense, since some differentially private mechanisms, and don't despair, we're going to show you that not all of them have to do this. But since many differentially private mechanisms have to take this worst case scenario into consideration, you can imagine a situation, Chris is just slightly ahead of me on the, uh, on the animations, but you can imagine a weird situation in which only two people reported income, for instance and no one else did and then as given in this dot so initially the lower left is i think i as i recall or the lower right excuse me gold and blue dots were the only two people who reported income now we are forced to then use their values to impute on everyone else again this is extremely unlikely to happen in practice but it's a potential situation that we have to account for so if you advance now what we see is that 
blue imputes on one person and gold imputes on everyone else. What happens then if we pluck that gold donor out of the data set? Remember, we're trying to cover any change. We pluck that gold donor out of the data set, now everyone is suddenly blue. And so this means that the global sensitivity is proportion, is, or sorry, is essentially the size of the data set. That's a huge problem for any mechanism that's based on the noise that's uh, tuned to global sensitivity. So next slide. So what are some solutions? Well, we could ignore the data, but this is generally problematic as I'm sure many of you know, um, because the data is typically not missing completely at random. And so doing that gens tends to bias your answers. So instead, what we're gonna look for is a low sensitivity allocation method. Uh, and specifically, we turned for both of the next two problems essentially to something called smooth sensitivity, which doesn't have to worry exactly about that global worst case. It, it very much focuses on the sort of the case that you're in and how far removed you are from such a global worst case. So it tempers the amount of noise that you have to add uh, in a way that ends up adding dramatically less noise in real world applications. Uh, next slide, and I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. All right, so as Keith just mentioned, our, our fundamental uh, kind of technical tool behind this work is this smooth sensitivity designed by Nissim, Rashad, Nakova, and Smith in 2007. And so the idea is these, these pathological data sets like Keith was just showing you, aren't going to occur in real life. So if we think instead about only looking at somehow neighboring databases that are close to the real data set, if you will, um, then changing one individual in moving between those databases isn't going to have a substantial impact, um, at least under, under normal circumstances. So smooth sensitivity, the formula is at the bottom of this slide here. Like I said, it's a little technical, but the, the fundamental idea is that when comparing how big a change can be between two data sets, it weights that by how close these data sets are to the real data set. And so, just to note, smooth sensitivity does provide differential, it does satisfy differential privacy. It's just a, yes. a different way of doing it. Yes, thank you. So smooth sensitivity um, does, there are mechanisms both based on um, Laplace noise and Gaussian noise to get, um, it will be epsilon delta differential privacy and pure epsilon differential privacy respectively. Um, okay, so um, our next is our problem statement. So we're looking at, um, deterministic nearest neighbor. And what we mean by deterministic here is that if we were to add an individual and then delete them again, so that we're back to the original data set, we would want our, our imputation to look the exact same so that somehow the change is zero when we're looking at that. So um, once we set up our technical definition for this, we can look at the upper bound of, on the local sensitivity of some function like a count or a mean or a variance of some attribute. And then, um, compute a, a smooth sensitivity and then make an, a differentially private mechanism based upon that. And so um, we did do a, an empirical evaluation of this. So we were asking um, about income. And so what we did is we modeled missing data based on the ACS public use microdata. So in the microdata set, there's a flag for when data was missing and is then imputed. So we were able to uh, train our model based on other attributes of records to, to predict when a, an income value was missing. Then we applied that model to the 1940 census, um, which we treated as a complete data set. So there's no weighted sample issues, there's unknown ground truth. And then we were able to synthesize, uh, take a sample to synthesize it being the ACS and then synthesize um, missing data within that sample using our model. And so here's our, our first query. Um, we were looking at the mean uh, individual income ages 20 through 59. So this, the, the graph on the left, this third box plot is this obnoxious global sensitivity that's essentially the size of the data sets. So you can see the, the range of the mean income is you know, negative 300 to 1500. It's, it's it completely obliterated everything. Uh, the, the graph on the right, however, uh, both of these still achieve differential privacy. 
Um, and it's the same too is on the left. Um, and so we see here that we have this substantial bias reduction between ignoring missing data and imputing missing data. And the important thing to mention here is that each run, we were taking a sample of the 1940 census. So most of the noise that's showing up here is actually sampling noise. So just if we eyeball it, it looks like the spread of these is about the same, at least to me, uh, but um, the differential privacy noise for the imputed missing data is substantially higher than that for the ignored missing data, but the sampling noise is yet substantially higher. So this, this difference, although significant, kind of washes out in, in this graph. And we have two more examples. Now we're looking at the proportion of individuals uh, unable to support a family of four above the poverty line. And here we see that we, we still get this bias reduction without a substantial um, change in variance. But the key here is that we see at different demographics, we, we sort of have a different amount of bias reduction. So for the 20 to 29 year olds, um, there was a bias reduction, but, but significantly larger bias reduction for the 40 to 49 year olds. Eric, we're at time. Do you have some final concluding thoughts? Uh, Chris, you are muted. Just like to mention, we do have this second work we've done, which is satisfying post gratification in this. And, uh, you know, we, for those of you who attended the talk on waiting, you discovered some of this. This is another one where global sensitivity is off the charts, but using smooth sensitivity, we're able to get something. Uh, this is a kind of more recent work. Uh, we're currently running experiments similar to those that we did uh, that you just saw to see how effective this technique is. But just to, to finish off, let me uh, actually, you know, to conclude on this, formal privacy for the ACS is challenging, but we, we believe this is a solvable problem. It's going to require some new techniques. These could be new approaches to differential privacy, like those we've developed. It could be new techniques for bias and variance reductions, like uh, small area estimation techniques that are more amenable to formal privacy than the techniques that are currently in use. Or it could involve new formal privacy definitions and methods. Uh, it may not be differential privacy, but something that provides comparable uh, protection, but uh, is more appropriate for complex surveys. Uh, you know, the research community is making advances on all of these fronts. And, you know, so the, the takeaway from this is that the way that ACS will be formally private, we don't know yet but that uh, there's certainly advances being made that this is something that can happen. And um, it's, you know, our belief is that it's not going to be uh, as bad in terms of the impact on data as people fear. And in fact, may well come with certain advantages in new and better statistical methods being used to generate the results. Thank you. And next we'll have David Fulch with approaches for computing margins of error for user defined variables based on the American Community Survey. Thank you, Beth. Let me get my screen share and done right. Um, one second. Are you able to see? Oh, no. So no, I see it. Thank you. OK, cool. Thanks. Um, OK. So um, again, my name is David Fulch. I'm at Northern Arizona University. And this is work uh, done in collaboration with Seth Spielman and Molly Graber. Um, 
okay. Um, so, okay, so I wanna talk about margins of error in the ACS. Um, and so this is an example of a typical ACS table containing estimates and margins of error. And as in the previous <laughs> talk, we found out the relationship between margins of error and estimates is really complicated. So we can look at, for example, uh, the Navajo tribal grouping in Arizona, and we see the population's about 160,000, and they have a relatively low margin of error as measured by the coefficient of variation, which is 0 0.027. So that means that the, the Navajo tribal grouping count is highly reliable. But if we look at the Chippewa population in Arizona, we see it's 1,363 1, as the estimate, plus or minus 1,052. Uh, much higher coefficient of variation and much less reliable estimate. And so there's sort of these general patterns where uh, populations that are lower representation tend to have high relative margins of error. But things get more complicated. Sometimes this is African American and Native American. Um, and you see here that the Native American population is about 3% lower than the African American population, but the margin of error is about 12% higher. And so this is reflecting this sort of myriad issues going on with sampling strategies, response rates, and all sorts of other factors um, that kind of get in, get in the way here. And then there's even cases where there's no margin of error at all, like for the total population, because these numbers are controlled outside of the ACS. So, how, so one of the issues is that users want all kinds of estimates and the Census Bureau can't possibly publish all of them. So if we wanted to know the total number of people that identify as Chippewa or Navajo, we can easily just sum those two estimates. But computing the unpublished margin of error on this to match that unpublished sum is not quite as straightforward. So the Census Bureau provides advice and some recommendations on how to uh, deal with this um, in various handbooks that are published. Um, and they provide four formulas, the summation and proportion and ratio and product formulas. And these are essentially sort of standard textbook formulas. Um, although, as I'll talk about later, one of them isn't and for good reason. Um, but these are easily computed from the data from the previous two tables. As long as you have the estimates and the margin of error of the inputs, you can get, the, you can get uh, an estimation of the margin of error of the output. So some considerations for those, those standard formulas or this analytic approach. Um, first of all, again, it's easy to compute from published data, but um, the formulas, you only have these four formulas to work with um, and they don't cover all cases. So this is an example of the Teal Index of Residential Segregation, which involves ratios, multiplication, summation, natural logs. And so combining those four equations with all these other things can make the computation of margin of error pretty difficult. A second issue is covariance. And so again, those formulas from the previous slide are largely sort of textbook formulas, but they're formulas of independent variables. But in reality, most of the data we're going to be dealing with in the ACS, especially in these kind of formulas, is going to be have some sort of um, covariance. So the, this first red block here is the standard formula from the previous slide if you were trying to compute the standard error for two values summed. And it's missing that second covariance term is not included. So an alternative to the analytic approach from the previous slides is what we're calling the simulation approach. And this approach addresses the weak, the flexibility weakness. So assume what, so it's based on the idea that we assume each published ACS estimate comes from a normal distribution with a mean of the ACS estimate and a standard deviation of the ACS standard error. And the way this works is you compute many combined estimates. So we're gonna define a normal distribution for each of the input variables so for example, in our case, a distribution for Chippewa population count, a distribution for Navajo population count, we're gonna make one draw from each population, from each distribution, compute the combined estimate, which is, compute that summation, and then we're gonna repeat that process many, many times. So let's say a thousand times, which will give us a thousand summations, a distribution of a thousand summations. Now, what's good here is that this can also apply to the more complicated Teal index or all sorts of other kind of measures. And then we compute the margin of error from this distribution by what we do is we define an ACS style, uh, so a 90% confidence interval, uh, 
and we look at the difference between the fifth and the 95th percentiles of those combined estimates and then take half that difference. And there's other approaches um, for doing to, to compute the margin of error, but this is the one that we, we go with. Um, and so considerations for the simulation approach. Well, again, it uses the standard ACS data. Uh, however, it's a pretty complicated computational process. I mean, I put that on one slide, but there's a lot of finer details behind the scenes um, for dealing with this. But it is flexible. So you can apply this to any, any kind of measure you can dream up. You can um, apply this, um, this kind of an approach. Um, but again, it still doesn't consider covariance. A third approach is the replicates approach. And the published margins of error um, in the published tables from the Census Bureau use a replicates approach to compute, to compute those MOEs. Um, and so what the Census Bureau does internally is they compute 80 replicates of the entire ACS built from the original surveys. And the strength of this methodology is that each replicate is itself internally consistent. And, in re and recently, in the past few years, the Census Bureau started publishing these replicate tables for certain ACS estimates. And so the approach, the computational approach, is similar to um, the simulation approach, except in this case, the Census Bureau gives you the simulated values. So what you do is you compute the combined estimate, again, that summation or the teal index or whatever it is, you compute that on each one of the 80 replicates. And the result of that is that you now have a distribution of 80 values. And again, you compute the, um, the margin of error using standard formulas. Um, in this case, we're gonna look at what sort of inside of that square root is the combined estimate computed from the replicate data minus the combined estimate computed from the original data. And you compute this to get a margin of error. So some considerations for the replicates approach. Um, the biggest issue is that it's limited to the estimates and years and geographic scales with published replicate tables. So that's the big limitation. Um, it's moderately complicated computational process. You don't have to do the simulations, but I will tell you wrangling the CSV files that the Census Bureau publishes is a little bit of a challenge, um, but not too big of a deal. Um, again, it's flexible, so you can apply it to any combined estimate. And it includes the covariance, which is the real strength here. So we have this question, which is, how do these user-defined methods match up with the published margins of error? And so what we, what we did here is we built a testing framework um, where we needed um, published inputs and outputs of the estimates and the margins of error. So what I mean by that is, if we want to test if the user computed margin of error on a sum of two values, how well it matches, we need the estimates and margin of error of the two inputs and the estimate and margin of error of the output. And so we need those six values in order to test if our home our home brewed method actually will match the published the published outcome. So that way, so. And we also needed cases where the data was available in the replicate table. So when you combine all of that, there's not too many cases to work with, um, but we'll show you the ones in the next few slides, the ones that we tested. Um, so we're gonna look at five-year estimates using the 2011 to 2015 data for all counties in the United States. And as a small caveat, um, zero estimates in the, the way the Census Bureau computes zero estimates on um, or the margin of error on zero estimates is sort of an ad hoc approach, which means that the user defined method also has to be ad hoc to some extent. Um, so what, we're gonna exclude those from the results I'm gonna show you in the next few slides, but I'm happy to talk about that problem later if you'd like. Um, but the first key finding is that the user implemented replicate approach matches the published values. So we can re reproduce those without a problem. and so. As a result, we're only going to present the results for analytic and simulation approaches, which to some extent will show why the replicate approach is, is generally the way to go if possible. So we first test how user-defined MOEs on summations of two values deviate from published MOEs for those sums. 
So here, the green box plots are the county distribution for the analytic case. The orange box plots are for the simulation case. And the y-axis is the percent deviation from the published MOE. So what that means is if an estimate comes close to that horizontal red line at the zero point on the y-axis, that means that the user computed margin of error is pretty close to the published margin of error. So if we look at that first pair of box plots, this is for a poverty of six to 11 year olds where we sum over gender. And what you can see is that for this case, the user defined margins of errors tend to underestimate the published margins of error. If you look at the fourth pair of box plots, that's for a bachelor's degree, again, summed over gender, you see that we also tend to, the user defined methods tend to underestimate the published margin of error. The other four pairs here, all to varying degrees, tend to overestimate the, um, the published margin of error. Something else to notice here is that the distributions themselves are quite a bit different depending on the domain that you are studying. And second, the, the analytic and simulation approaches tend to, the distributions tend to match each other, hinting that the underlying theory for both of these is similar. In these examples, um, we fix the domain to poverty and we're gonna sum over increasing numbers of gender and age groups. So the first block of four pairs is for various combinations of uh, childhood poverty. And the second, the second four pairs are for um, summations over the larger population that's nested. So 25 and older, 18 and older, 16 and older, and five and older. So by the time you get to the last pair there, we're summing 24 values. And the overall takeaway from this is as you add more, um, more and more values to the summation, we tend to, we see in general a further deviation from the published value. So this scatter plot tries to show uh, that the deviations are from the previous two slides are largely caused by that missing covariance term. And so here in this case, each point is a county and the green points are using the analytic method the, the orange points are using the simulation method. The y-axis is the same, again, that percent deviation from the published margin of error. And the x-axis now is the correlation between the input variables over the 80 replicates. And so what you see when the correlation is zero, the user computed methods tend to match the published methods. And that makes intuitive sense. The, the, user, the user methods assume independence between the variables, between the inputs or the estimates. And so that case will match the published MOE. When the correlation is positive, you tend to have, under, you tend to have an underestimation of the published margin of error. And when the correlation is negative, you tend to have an overestimation. And so, um, and the intuition here is that when you, have, when you have negative correlation, when you have one value is high, the other value tends to be low and vice versa, which tends to narrow the distribution as opposed to the case where when you have positive correlation, when one value is high, the other one's gonna be high. When one other value is low, the other one's gonna be low, which is gonna elongate or extend the distribution. So if we come back to this slide, looking at these poverty values, we see that poverty tends to underestimate and the intuition here is that if men are in poverty, it's likely that women are going to be in poverty. If kids are in poverty, it's likely that older folks are going to be in poverty. So these tend to have a positive correlation, which is going to result in this underestimation of the margin of error. Um, this final um, set of box plots here looks at uh, proportions. So similar, as, similar to before, in this case, what you see is that the simulation value in both of these figures is the same. Uh, those are the brown box plots, but the green are the analytic. And in the lower left, we're using the Census Bureau's recommended formula for, the, for computing an analytic margin of error on a proportion. And the upper right is more the textbook formula, sort of generic for division. And so in the upper right, we see that the simulated approach matches similar to the analytic, whereas in the lower left, the Census Bureau recommendation is actually much better and gets us much closer to the uh, published margin of error and with much narrower range.
So some takeaways here, recommendations. So recommendations are the replicate approach is always the best. Um, it can handle most any user defined combination, uh, but it's not always possible due to replicate table availability. The analytic and simulation approaches give similar results for summations. And since the analytic approach is much simpler to compute, we certainly recommend using that. Um, the analytic approach produces better results than the simulation approach for proportions, assuming that you're using the Census Bureau's recommended formula. The ratios, we did not directly test those, but our other results indicate that the analytic and simulation approaches are going to give uh, similar results. And sort of the everything else case, so if you have a complex user-defined combination and there was no replicate tables available, then the simulation approach is the recommendation. So again, I want to thank my collaborators, uh, Seth Spielman at University of Colorado Boulder and Molly Graber at the uh, uh, Department of City Planning at the City of New York. Um, so thank you and I look forward to questions at the end of the session. Thank you. And next, we will have Corey Sparks with uncertainty in life expectancy in small areas when using ACS population estimates. Thanks, Beth. I definitely think David and I could have a beer and talk about this for ages. Okay. So um, thanks, everybody, uh, for coming today. <clears throat> My name is Corey Sparks. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio in the Department of Demography. And this is a latest iteration of some work I started a couple of years ago for the Population Association of America meeting, looking at using measurement error models and how they impact uh, inferential analysis using ACS. And this is a, an examination of how it affects life expectancy estimates in small areas when we use the ACS as the denominator. Uh, we all know this, um, ACS was meant to replace the long form. Uh, problems though exist because uh, the smaller the geography you move to, the bigger and bigger the measurement error and the estimates gets because the sample size used to drive the estimates gets smaller and smaller. So by the time you get to tracks and block groups, um, the estimates are usually based on very, very small samples. Uh, Spielman et al. and a couple of papers have looked at how different methods for aggregating uh, these high variance areas to lower variance sort of clusters of areas is one way to do this, especially when you're looking for uh, things like poverty rates for minority groups in small geographies. Those estimates tend to be uh, dramatically overweight, uh, outweigh the, uh, the error in those estimates dramatically outweigh the estimates themselves. So uh, the margins of error, uh, this, the Bureau uh, really encourages people to consider uh, using these. And the previous paper did a fantastic job of illustrating uh, how this works, as well as have seen numerous papers today uh, that talked about this. Uh, they really encourage people uh, to, use, to be mindful of the margins of error, although sometimes this can be a challenge, uh, especially if you're doing complicated analysis. Um, We've seen lots of researchers in lots of different fields use the ACS in an inferential context and in statistical analysis as predictor variables, going into regressions, uh, to drive indices off of factor analysis, things like that. Uh, and the vast majority of these uh, do not control any, anything about the standard errors, uh, the measurement error involved, and the estimates themselves. Uh, we saw Nipriella and Ditton in 2017 use the ACS uh, in a bootstrap fashion uh, to calculate margins of error for a complicated metric, just like David was talking about in his paper, uh, there's for the segregation index. And then Orndahl and Wheeler uh, conducted an epidemiological study uh, two years ago where they included measurement error in the ACS on the predictor side of things to see how that influenced uh, spatial clustering and risk I believe it was a cancer incident, no, suicide uh, incidents uh, analysis they were talking about. Um, uh, we had from a couple of years ago at PAA, uh, myself and a co-author uh, did another analysis where we were looking at small area estimates of crude mortality and the bias in, introduced uh, in those types of analysis, whenever you include the margins of error in the ACS and the regression model directly, 
And so that kind of leads us into what we're talking about today. So an example of this, uh, if we approach the ACS naively, then this is what we think that we're measuring. Uh, this is a quasi fake uh, estimate of the number of children under age five in a census tract. And if we don't pay attention to the measurement error at all, then we think we end up with the line. We think we end up with this nice estimate. It is what it is, we'll move on about our day. But depending on the type of place that you're looking at, that estimate could be pretty accurate, meaning it has a relatively low margin of error relative to the mean. And, and heaven forbid you're in the place like this green, poly, this green density here that has a, a very uh, low accuracy or high variance estimate where you could end up not only with the estimate itself, you know, they all have the same point estimate, but the error in that estimate could even go negative, routinely does go negative, um, which produces nonsensical uh, for ranges in the measurements themselves. So um, enter the, st the statistical point of view on this, which I approach from a measurement error model perspective. Uh, these have been around for a while. Uh, two two uh, large families of these exist. One's the Berkson error model. Uh, this is primarily uh, for data that are grouped. So if you have like a hierarchical model and you're using ACS to measure a variable at a census tract level, everybody in the census tract has the same uh, value for the variable. So they have a shared uh, error in that estimate. Uh, the classical error model is a little bit different. It treats the measurement error itself as a unique to each observation. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about today. So uh, whenever we're talking about a, a rate estimate, uh, we usually have, it's not, it's not relying on ACS uh, specifically for the numerator. Uh, we will typically use something like a Poisson or negative binomial distribution to model our outcome and thinking about a regression setting, you'd set up a generalized linear model or some sort of model like that uh, to see how uh, all the predictors on the right-hand side of the equation influence uh, the rate itself, the relative risk, depending on how you parameterize uh, your denominators. Uh, so we're, we have some observed count uh, as a numerator. This typically comes from another data source, um, things like vital statistics, for example. Uh, you can derive, you know, the numerator could come from anywhere, but the denominators are, you know, more and more commonly, especially for small areas, being drawn from ACS. And my, my point is that when the ACS is used as a population estimate for an offset term in a generalized linear model, then you have to uh, take into account the uncertainty in the estimate itself, in the model internally, or otherwise your point estimates for the rates, uh, will, they will effectively ignore all of the uncertainty in the population denominators going into the rates themselves which could then produce um, you know, erroneous or at least high variance uh, rates. So my, 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 my purpose today and some of the work I've been doing recently is um, uh, to look at how much bias and variance is introduced into the rates themselves when you do or don't take care of these things. So uh, the methods that we're talking about today uh, is a classical measurement error model. Um, this is basically what's considered a latent variable model where we uh, partially observe the variable of interest. In this case, the population estimate. Um, in, in this case, it's an age-specific population estimate. Um, and when you have this type of uh, modeling uh, paradigm, then a Bayesian modeling strategy is often uh, very uh, powerful way to get to where you want to go. Um, Age-specific mortality rates in this context are estimated um, as our primary uh, target variable here. So we have the number of deaths uh, observed in a given age range is our numerator, and the uncertain population size is our denominator. So we generate a latent variable model for our denominators by assuming that the ACS estimate, uh, or the, the true population estimate Z is really unknown, but 
it's partially observed through our estimate of X here, which is the uh, population count from the ACS. And then we know how much variance is, uh, the Census Bureau gives us how much variance is in the estimate as the standard error of the estimate or the margin of error of estimate uh, provided in the uh, respective tables. Uh, if, we, if we model the, each population then as a latent variable, we can then sample directly from the implied sampling distribution here uh, for each population estimate for each small area. And you can generate a large number of these uh, uh, simulated or uh, sampled offset terms for the model. From this, if you do this a large number of times, you'll obtain a distribution of the age specific mortality rate for each small area and age combination. Uh, to do this, I use the STAN uh, Bayesian modeling language. You could just as easily do it with a straight Monte Carlo estimate, uh, just generating random numbers from a normal distribution. Um, and from these, uh, you'll get, we'll get like a thousand estimates of each age specific mortality rate for 10 age groups for every county uh, that I'm looking at. Uh, and from these, I can then derive a standard life table for each place derived off the age specific mortality rates and their distributions. Uh, the data that I'm looking for here are we arrived at from an IRB a couple of years ago from the state of Texas. These are individual death certificates from the Texas Department of State Health Services. Um, these are geocoded uh, to counties for the current analysis. Uh, further work will look at smaller geographies. Uh, we aggregate the data by 10 year age groups within each county. And approximately during the period we're looking at, which is 2010 and 2015, there was about 840,000 deaths observed in the state during that period. Uh, future analysis uh, that I'm currently looking at takes longer to do uh, will be done at the zip code and census tract levels uh, to match up with other uh, small area life expectancy estimates that are currently um, shown. Um, here's a here's some couple of examples of the results that are obtained. Again, um, the first thing we do is we get a thousand estimates or mul multiple, you know. You can choose the number that you want. I used a uh, thousand estimates of each age specific mortality rate for every place, 254 counties in the state. Uh, from those, I then generated effectively a thousand life tables, estimates of life expectancy of birth for each place in the state. And then I just took, I just took a few examples. This is a sample of five small counties, a population less than 5,000 people. Uh, you can see some counties are pretty well behaved in their life expectancy estimates. These are places that either the, uh, the estimates themselves had low margins of error or the, uh, there was actually quite a bit of observed mortality in these places, uh, but they, send, they, they tend to be kind of stable. And then you have other much more problematic counties like 481155 here that has a very high variance in the life expectancy at birth. It has an average of about, uh, about 68 years, but its range goes from uh, about 60 up to about 72. So very, very large variance estimate of overall life expectancy. And that's typically what you see in areas that have smaller uh, population sizes. Again, it's the, it's the legacy of the ACS small area estimate higher variance and smaller places. Well, it, it affects life expectancy in the same way. Uh, here's the, the flip side of the coin. These are counties that have large populations, over a million. Uh, these are basically the large metros in the state. And you see these have very, very high precision, low variance estimates in the life expectancies themselves. These aren't all of the county, this may be all the counties that have uh, um, uh, more than a million people. And, but they're very, very sharp, precise estimates of life expectancy, low variance. Again, what we should expect from the ACS. Uh, if we summarize this by uh, sort of the distribution of population size of counties in the state, if we effectively break it into uh, quartiles, uh, we see that in counties that have less than 5,000 people, if uh, what, what I did here was I took 
the 95% uh, in Bayesian language, they call it credible interval, the 95% credible interval for each life expectancy and subtracted the high from the low value. This gives you sort of a, a range of the 95% credible interval for each estimate. Uh, on average, in very small places, this difference was about 14 years. So between the high end and the low end of the estimates, you had a very dramatic, large uh, average deviation in overall life expectancy. Uh, I did throw out a couple of counties here that had very, very, very wonky estimates. And so the, the estimates that are produced here are sensical, let's say. Um, as you move up to larger and larger counties, on average, again, the error goes to seven years and those that are between five, 10,000, uh, four years and above for basically every other size of counties if you look at the overall averages. So this is great. Uh, one thing I was wanting to do though, is I wanna compare the results we're getting using the Bayesian measurement error models to estimates that are produced by places like the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation Research, University of Washington. And, uh, and eventually uh, NCHS also has a small area life expectancy estimation program um, that produce analytic variances for their uh, uh, life expectancy estimates, not sampling or Bayesian ones. And so I wanted to kind of compare what I was seeing from my measurement error perspective versus their analytic uh, numbers. Um, here, we, here again, we see the, 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 dip, the sort of the average or the pattern and the differences uh, between the low, the upper and the lower confidence interval, credible interval for the life expectancy estimates. Uh, it's, it's very, very, it's high in areas that have very small populations. And as the population grows into the millions, uh, you see the variance, uh, the difference between the low and the high become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, so this is again following, I think, what makes sense to most of us who have worked with the ACS estimates before. If you compare Fine. the estimates derived from this method to those from the IHME for county level uh, life expectancy in the state of Texas, uh, you see a very different story. Uh, their, their estimates for these small counties, uh, the same counties that I'm looking at here, uh, for the small counties, they, they measured about three years difference on an average between the lower and the upper 95% confidence center while using their analytic formulas. Uh, it goes up a little bit, but still all of their estimates always have lower variance than the ones that I'm using, uh, than the ones that I'm producing using the measurement error perspective which makes me conclude that uh, the analytic formulas for the variance estimates and life expectancies that they're using are, uh, they're, correct, they're correct analytically, but they're not very accurate in terms of the overall difference. So conclusions for this, uh, denominators matter, especially if we're using uh, the ACS uh, in some sort of rate estimation, uh, the uncertainty in these dramatically influence the rates themselves that you're calculating. And we just need to be aware of this, like we are of the uncertainty in the ACS estimates at writ large. Uh, analytical approximations don't look like they're capturing how much variation is introduced into the life expectancy estimates based off my comparisons with other published estimates uh, using very similar methodology, very similar data, but analytic versus the Bayesian uh, uh, method of variance estimation is very is producing very different estimates. Uh, small population areas have greater noise in uh, in these estimates. Uh, again, that, that makes a lot of sense based on what we know from the ACS. And further work that I'm doing is examining smaller areas, um, tracks, and zip codes. Uh, thank you all for your attention, and uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you. And last but not least, Joe Tusillo with Toward an Individual uh, Individual Oriented Geodemographic Classification of United States Neighborhoods. Great. Um, thank you, Beth. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Tusillo. I'm a research scientist in the Geospatial Sciences and Human Security Division at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And today I'll be talking to you about um, development of an individual oriented typology of social areas in the United States. Um, 
To begin this talk, um, I want to uh, first um, highlight kind of the thing that makes this approach individual oriented. Um, the backbone of our approach is a project housed in the human geography group at um, ORNL called Urban Pop. Um, Urban Pop is a spatial microsimulation framework that leverages intersensal data um, from the ACS um, to produce um, daytime and nighttime synthetic populations at the high spatial resolution of block groups. Um, synthetic populations are realistic recreations of an area's population um, based on um, published um, data, in this case from the ACS summary file, um, about those areas. Um, this approach is advantageous because it allows us to, um, to match individuals to small areas in, in a way that um, preserves um, the privacy of the original ACS PUMS uh, public use microdata sample respondents. Um, Urban Pop is updated annually. Um, it features coverage for the full United States um, and it allows research to, researchers to create customizable demographic profiles and what we term packages um, for specific planning and decision support applications. Um, Urban Pup began as an effort to scale a population synthesizer um, specialized for the ACS um, to um, the national level and extend it to um, travel simulation. Um, it started with um, Pitney Bowes commute data, but swapped that out in 2018 um, for um, open source data, namely the lead origin destination employment statistics or loads. Um, along the way, it also picked up um, several application specific packages, including um, in transportation, energy, and epidemiology. And most recently, um, efforts have been focused on updating Urban Pop to the 2019 um, ACS five year estimates and 2018 loads, as well as accompanying those worker commute, um, uh, the, the worker commute model with um, a new school travel behavior model. So here's the core uh, workflow of Urban Pop. Um, it ingests ACS data at two levels, um, at the individual level from the public use microdata sample and at the geographic level from the summary file. Um, it feeds that information into a population synthesizer to generate um, a residential population layer. Um, it then combines um, the residential layer with um, information from the loads and the Homeland Infrastructure Foundational Level Data Set or Heifeld. Um, to then um, generate a second um, daytime synthetic population. Um, then descriptors kind of related to that urban pop package are extended to the synthetic population um, to sort of guide um, different um, research tasks. So the central challenge with urban pop to date has been that while the synthetic populations are highly customizable, they're also a challenge to use out of the box. The synthetic populations um, are described such that each um, unique combination of, um, of descriptors um, extended to an individual in the synthetic population is treated as a separate variable. Um, this can potentially overload uh, researchers um, uh, because there are, there are potentially hundreds or thousands of um, kind of unique variables to work with. Um, so the motivation behind this work and developing this typology is to um, kind of think about repackaging urban pop in a way that presents high level information on, on people and the social mix um, in different uh, block groups to aid um, those different um, application specific packages. The ones that we've been looking at this through um, is that of geodemographics, a framework for generalizing um, places by where people are um, and how they live. And on the right um, is an example of sort of a typical geodemographic classification um, by Spielman and Singleton. Um, we can see that there are 10 sort of um, distinct neighborhood classes um, that in turn are represented by some generalized segments of the population. So that's what we're hoping to extend to urban pop. Um, the geodemographic extension for urban pop um, is called bundle up. Um, the name comes from a quote um, by George Galster, which states, that neighborhoods and other social areas are bundles of spatial attributes associated, associated with clusters of residences and produced by the same actors that consume them. Um, by combining um, urban pop with geodemographics, we're able to assess the bundling of neighborhood actors, including residents, workers, and students at varying times of day, um, thereby extending the notion of how people live and where people live to how and where they interact. 
So here's the workflow, uh, the urban pop workflow extended to bundle up. So rather than extend um, those descriptors derived from the pumps directly to our synthetic populations, um, we've added a segmentation stage in which we identify sort of a generalized set or a more compact set of um, group or cohort profiles um, that we use to label the synthetic populations. Um, then on these synthetic populations, we perform cluster analysis um, to develop um, daytime and nighttime um, neighborhood profiles at the block group level. So the proof of concept I'm going to be showing you today is uh, for the Knoxville Metropolitan Statistical Area consists of um, five counties surrounding Knoxville in East Tennessee. Um, and the example I'm going to be walking through is the development of sort of a basic demographics SES accessibility mock urban pop package. Um, so urban pop is run for um, at the, the public for, for public use microdata areas, these uh, units of roughly 100,000 people. Um, there are six that overlap with the Knoxville MSA. And in addition to those, um, we included um, sort of the, the first order neighbors of those Pumas at a lag distance of 100 kilometers to kind of simulate um, inflows of um, daytime populations, um, including workers and students from outside the MSA. So the first stage in this procedure is population synthesis uh, run on each Puma. Um, and to achieve this, uh, we use a technique called PMEDM, um, which is specialized um, for ACS estimates. Um, PMEDM uh, creates synthetic populations in such a way that the, the attributes of the synthetic populations when aggregated um, not only faithfully preserve um, the ACS, the, the matching ACS summary file estimates, but they also preserve their error variances. Um, the, in, in other words, they're, they're also faithful to sort of the margins of error that would be published along with the summary file estimates. Um, these target variables at both, at both the individual and geographic levels are known as constraints. So here's the list of tables, the ACS tables from which constraints were drawn for this analysis. Um, again, they kind of, they're, they're all sort of features of the population that match that theme of basic demographics, um, SES and um, accessibility. And then once we've generated our synthetic populations, um, we can then generalize um, sort of descriptors um, either um, based on the constraints or sort of by proxy from the POMs um, to describe the synthetic population. So in this case, we have things like age, race and ethnicity, living arrangement, um, employment, education, and some basic mobility characteristics. Um, and we extend these to um, sort of the pooled population of all of those pumas, those 18 pumas in our um, study extent, and then we use those to perform um, segmentation. So um, now we've kind of moved into the bundle up stage. Um, we're going to perform segmentation um, using a technique called monothetic divisive clustering or divclust. Um, divclust creates a clustering structure um, that resembles a decision tree um, where each split um, is, uh, represents the level of one of the um, descriptors of those individuals um, in the synthetic population. Um, so each cohort profile, kind of the leaves of this tree, is characterized by the presence or absence of specific um, attributes in our descriptors. So here are the cohort profiles that we identified for the Knoxville MSA at uh, two levels of generalization. So there's kind of a higher level set of um, eight segments or cohort profiles and a more detailed set of 27. Um, the bolded tiles um, on this plot represent attributes that people in that segment always possess. Um, the blank tiles represent one uh, attributes that people never possess. Um, so kind of along the lines of um, these descriptors chosen, we've identified kind of differences in labor force participation among adults, um, uh, professional and non-professional occupations, um, as well as um, K through 12 students and a smaller subset of um, likely sort of younger children. And then with the cohort profiles in hand, we can then um, characterize our synthetic populations. Um, so we've zoomed into just one of the Pumas um, within the Knoxville MSA. Um, and um, each of these glyph plots um, represents 
um, the prevalences of each of those um, higher level cohort profiles in each block group. Um, so we can see that um, there's relative homogeneity kind of among the block group synthetic populations in our nighttime layer, but things shift considerably um, into the daytime. Um, in some block groups, um, like this one that's highlighted, there's an influx of K through, yeah, K through 12 students in uh, places where there are schools, um, in places where there are high concentrations of jobs in industry, we see an influx of skilled and unskilled workers. Um, and in places that are largely re residential, we see sort of a remnant population of um, largely seniors who are not in the labor force. And then given this, um, given this characterization of our synthetic populations, we can then abstract things one level higher um, to develop sort of a high level catalog of synthetic populations and daytime and nighttime activities. Um, accomplish this here um, by performing diffclust again on aggregate um, block group characteristics of the, day, the nighttime uh, population and the nighttime daytime difference in um, the cohort um, prevalences. Um, giving us a typology that simultaneously accounts for the block group social mix um, among residents and sort of large scale activity patterns that take place in those block groups. So here's an example of um, four um, block group um, average profiles that were identified. So this panel on the left um, shows us block groups where there's a tendency for um, kind of an outflow of workers during the day, an influx of K through 12 students and a remnant population of unemployed adults. Um, on the lower left panel, we see we've kind of teased out areas around the University of Tennessee um, where there's an influx of skilled workers during the day, um, perhaps academic faculty and staff, um, as well as unemployed adults, in this case, um, full-time students. Uh, the right two panels um, describe places where there are sort of differing influxes of skilled and unskilled workers um, on a typical day. So by combining um, urban pop with a geodemographic focus, we're able to sort of hone in on um, the emergent properties of um, block groups and other social areas. Um, we develop sort of this compact representation of social areas and activities that take place there using less information, as this quote states, than an exhaustive description of it would entail, um, while say, still saying quite a lot about it. In a practical sense, this allows us to orient tasks like planning and spatial policy interventions um, toward um, the critical needs of specific groups and block groups um, um, by uh, both the time of day and people's activities. So in the near term, um, we hope to extend this approach to develop um, tailor-made profiles for application-specific urban pop packages, including those linked to environmental hazards, um, health in place, and mobility and energy use. Um, there's interest in refining this approach um, and scaling it using deep learning and AI methods. Um, we also hope to um, develop some more public-facing tools, including a web portal and API, which allow researchers to engage um, with our uh, methods and data more closely. Um, and an eventual goal is to extend this approach um, to episodic layers using point of interest and time use data um, to kind of enhance the temporal resolution of our outputs. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you all. And I'm going to ask um, if speakers are willing to turn their cameras back on. Um, and you can stay muted until we have specific questions. Um, there are a couple that have come in. Um, so starting with the first one um, is, uh, I think, relates to the first panel. Um, don't undercounts in the census mean people are implicitly weighted in the census counts, so there's the same problem with census as in the ACS in terms of weighting. I have some thoughts about this, but um, Chris, Keith, or Eric, do one of you want to respond? I mean, I'll say that to the, to the extent that there are kind of adjustments made, uh, I could see how that happens. I'm not really familiar with the details of how um, of how the decennial works or how they account for that in 
uh, formal privacy in decennial. But, uh, but I, I think it's certainly not to the same extent uh, as occurs with ACS. And so, that, so that's why, you know, I think that ACS basically poses a, a lot of new challenges that you know, just because of the extent of these issues. Keith or Eric, do either of you want to speak on that? I mean, I, I think I would agree with Chris. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure something goes on. Uh, and again, it's not uh, a methodology that we ever really had to look into, but uh, certainly not to the same extent as we're seeing with the weights that we do know are used on uh, ACS data. And again, to the extent that this sensitivity of the query correlates with those weights, this is just a different, you know, probably two or three orders of magnitude um, in the one product versus the other. And I think the, the one piece that I would add to it is um, in one of them, weights are structural. I mean, they're, they're part of the process with ACS, whereas with census, it, it's not structural, it's not distributed evenly. There may be neighborhoods where many people are imputed and neighborhoods where no one is. And so the, the variation across space and across different demographic groups is not, uh, also not the same. Um, Another question for the first panelists. If we already have survey error, respondent error, and processing error in the ACS, do we need to, um, why do we need to introduce another set of errors in the ACS? And, and I will say that you are all getting a question that I got yesterday afternoon as well, so. <laughs> that's, that's actually a very interesting uh, thing. And there's been a lot of work done on, uh, can we, make use of kind of inherent types of errors. So for example, sampling error, there are some interesting, interesting things about that. So there are techniques um, developed for differential privacy that on, on samples that incorporate sampling error, there is an assumption in at least the one I'm familiar with uh, of secrecy of the sample, basically that you don't know whether someone has been sampled or not. Now, whether that's a fair thing to assume with, uh, you know, with a product like ACS, I, you know, I don't know. That's uh, that's for other people to think about. But it is certainly something that has been looked at. Uh, the the noise that satisfies differential privacy fall, comes from a different distribution than is then you would use or then you would get out of kind of random errors and combining these. Uh, I had a student who worked on that for a while and it was just a very difficult problem. Uh, so, so that is part of the issue is, is it's not a simple thing to do, but to the extent that such noise could be used to uh, you know, accomplish some of the goals of formal privacy, I think that is something that is being explored and is a very, uh, very interesting challenge. And, you know, hopefully we can do that. Uh, if I can piggyback yeah. on that for a second. Uh, Chris, if you don't mind muting, yeah, I don't know why our systems pick up a lot of feedback from each other. Um, the, the issue isn't to add noise, right? There is already noise there. The issue is to satisfy this formal privacy guarantee so that we can know that the privacy of the individuals involved in the sample are protected. Uh, and so again, as Chris said, to the extent that someone manages to leverage that sampling error, then fantastic, right? This is absolutely a win-win. As he said, it's difficult to do with the usual implementations of differential privacy. You switch to a different privacy definition that can make use of Gaussian noise. Maybe you can start doing this. Um, but the issue isn't just the addition of noise, right? It's the addition of targeted specific noise to satisfy this definition so that the Bureau knows that the, you know, that the privacy of individuals are protected. Uh, and so again, that's why at the moment it looks like an additional noise added on because the goal is that definition, right? The goal is that satisfying that definition. And at the moment that that sampling noise, although present and omnipresent, uh, simply doesn't do it. 
I'm pausing while I check and make sure no other new questions have come in. Um, while we're waiting for other audience members to ask questions, because um, I, I feel like today is today and yesterday were a lot about uh, noise introduction and disclosure avoidance. So I want to talk about some of the other papers and, and make sure that this doesn't turn into. I I am a, a big um, geek about all of the different um, margins of error and uh, sam and noise introduction methods. But um, I want to know a little bit about um, from Joe's presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of applications? Um, you know, who's who's using the data? Um, what sort of wins have they gotten from using um, the, the, the segmentation and the, the population, the synthetic population data? Um, yeah, so so Urban Pub is still a relatively new um, project, but um, the, yeah, we've, there's been um, interest recently in um, kind of, you know, one, one example is uh, kind of urban accessibility. Um, if you know if a, if a person you know what are the characteristics of a person in a neighborhood um where commutes are uh, or um sorry where, where access to services um, is maybe limited and um you know commutes range from half an hour to an hour um so th that's that's um an example of you know um perhaps an application where um someone would want sort of um, more direct information than having to comb through kind of a large catalog of um, descriptors on on uh, sort of unique individual types. Um, I've done a lot of work on the hazard side, um, and in particular, um, profiling uh, community social vulnerability um, to environmental hazards. Um, and, um, you know, this, this, this approach um, kind of provides um, like a sort of a counter approach to um, index based metrics of, of vulnerability in which you're actually characterizing um, the people who you know in an area um, who are who, who sort of directly stand to be impacted by the event um, and that that interest also kind of um, in turn um, flows into kind of um, environmental justice considerations. Um, so you know, in in um, you know areas with high risk of sea level rise or kind of limited infrastructure for preventing um, you know large scale flood events, um, um, you know who is most at risk? Okay, and I, I have wanna... a oh, sorry, no, no, I have a, I have a question for David, but if there's another um, if there's a follow up to to Joe's. Um, David, the question that came in is, do you recommend a certain statistical package such as R um, for computing margins of error using replicate weights, or is there are there advantages of one technology over another? Um, we have some we have some preliminary code in for Python. Um, it's in a package called SenPy, which you can find on GitHub. It's not in the main package yet. It's it's still sort of in testing mode. But a lot of what I talked, the methods I talked about today are there and you can, you can download them and view them. Um, but I, there's not really any, any particular software. I mean, Excel, you, the nice thing about the standard formulas from the book is you can do them in Excel. And um, any, but the other two, you, you really need some sort of programming framework to, to draw the simulations and, and do all the combinations. Can I quickly ask David a question? Panelists allowed to, okay. So, so yeah, so it doesn't surprise me at all that your simulation and your analysis were basically part and parcel with each other because basically, you know, we know that should happen. They're effectively doing something like central limit theorem. Um, and obviously it doesn't surprise me that as the correlation deviated away from zero, you saw your, you know, your, your uh, formulas and your simulations drifting away because your simulations were effectively assuming uncorrelated. Did you, ever try like estimating like a Pearson correlation coefficient or something and then like essentially sampling like a bivariate normal and just running that with simulate like because I because I, I agree with you that replicate weights make a lot of sense but there are times when you can't use them yeah so yes we tried a, we tried a million ways to okay. put the simulations um, yep. and all sorts of techniques drawing from the same you know like we tried all sorts of things but the problem is, is that each, there's no, to do the correlation you're talking about, you, you don't have 
each estimate has its own margin of error. And so, so the hook on that on that one slide where, where the the the, um, the slide with the uh, scatter plot, you actually have eighty values. And so when so that when the x-axis was the correlation among the eighty replicates, and that's why we could do it and feel confident that that's that was where the covariance was coming from. And that so, that puts yeah. us right but, at yeah, time. Yeah, we tried. Oh, okay. God. Yeah. So we tried. Anyways, we tried. We tried pulling from the same distributions. We tried a million things, and nothing, nothing could could simulate the, the correlations. All right, that puts us right at time. I want to thank all of you for being here today and for some really excellent presentations. Um, and for those of you who are still listening in, the recordings will be posted online later. Thank you all so much. Do they kick us out? No, anyways, okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>